Well, I think we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. I'm George Daly. I'm the Dean of Harvard Medical School, and this is the fourth public briefing of the Massachusetts Consortium on Pathogen Readiness, or MassCPR. MassCPR is led by Harvard Medical School, but it includes hundreds of scientists across 17 institutions whose collective goals are to address both the immediate challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the long-term need for enhanced preparedness for emerging pathogens. MassCPR was made possible thanks to a commitment from the China Evergrande Group to separately fund Harvard's efforts and the Guangzhou Institute of Respiratory Health to advance research on the scale and scope necessary to meet this extraordinary challenge. Other supporters of MassCPR include Mark and Lisa Schwartz, the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, and a number of other individuals who have donated to this important project. In the last nine months, SARS-CoV-2 has claimed more than 30 million infections globally and cost over 900,000 lives. In the United States, there have been 6.5 million plus infections, and we just surpassed 200,000 deaths. Our country is sadly the leader in a very, very grim race. The new virus has posed formidable scientific and medical challenges. In doing so, it has unapologetically exposed pathologies that are neither physiologic nor biologic in their origin. Systemic inequities, structural racism, disparate health outcomes, unequal disease burden borne by some groups of Americans. These deeply rooted inequities have rendered black, brown, low-income individuals, incarcerated people, and immigrants disproportionately vulnerable to the ravages of the virus and the disease that it causes. Of course, the notion that racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities intersect with disease and health is not new. We've long known from the field of social epidemiology that conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, and even some forms of cancer disproportionately affect certain populations. So much so that public health experts have measured differences in life expectancy between wealthier and poorer zip codes in US cities. COVID-19 is an unequal destroyer and its destruction, it has epitomized so much of what is wrong and unjust about our society. The drivers behind these disparities are both painfully familiar and copiously documented, poverty, lack of access to preventative and specialized care, bias, marginalization, chronic toxic stress, the list is long. Now this pandemic did not create these inequities, but it has potently magnified them. It has shown us with full force the lethal effects of chronic problems we have failed to resolve for far too long. In disease and health, these social and structural factors are just as important as the biology. Indeed, they can alter the biology. Scientists have been working tirelessly to unravel the biology and the behavior of the virus and to develop treatments and vaccines for the diseases and that it caused. They have made tremendous progress. Yet all this progress will be squandered if we fail to equalize access and availability for all. Solving the systemic inequities and investing in public health are of course the right thing to do, morally and ethically. But it's also our best shot at ensuring that we end the pandemic. Today's session is dedicated to discussing the health disparities we have witnessed with a new force in these last many months to diagnosing the pathologies that fuel them and to identifying possible solutions. Physician scientist Cheryl Clark will explore the biological and social determinants of disease and health, including structural and systematic drivers and how they intersect to amplify infection risk and disease development in COVID-19. Jim O'Connell will discuss how COVID-19 has affected homeless individuals while Elise Worsell will discuss the impact of the disease in jails and prisons. Next, Wes Boyd will pull the curtain back on what the pandemic has meant for immigrants and asylum seekers. And then finally, Barbara Beer will chart the way forward 
and discuss some possible solutions. We will then have some time reserved at the end to answer your questions. And please note that you can type your questions into the Q&A function so that we can compile them and we'll answer them at the end. Cheryl, over to you. Thank you so much, Dean Daly. So we should go to the next slide. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. I'm Cheryl Clark. I'm a hospital uh, medicine physician, a hospitalist, and a social epidemiologist. And today's topic focus on the prior slide is going to be three things. I'm going to talk to you about the social patterning of uh, COVID-19 and talk about how that draws out principles for what an equitable response to COVID-19 could look like with a specific example on how we managed COVID at my institution at Brigham, and then to give some general lessons learned during the pandemic. And on the next slide, as I mentioned, I am a hospitalist and I took care of patients on the COVID unit. And I wanted to start with this case to outline some of the issues that, uh, that we faced and to also talk about a case that continues to keep me up at night um, and certainly uh, was one of the, the cases that scared me the most, I think, when I was on service. And it's the case of this vibrant 60-year-old woman who was admitted with severe breathing difficulty, uh, who presented uh, re relatively late in her case. Uh, she wasn't able to get tested at a community testing site, and a language divide uh, delayed her care in the inpatient setting. As I uh, tried to take care of her, um, she happened to speak uh, Spanish and I spoke um, only English um, and really uh, poor Spanish. And in this context, uh, it took uh, time to be able to get access to interpreter services and to get access to that equipment. And uh, as I sort of looked at this uh, case, uh, there were moments where her oxygen needs were much higher than the oxygen that we could have provided to her. And uh, I finally, after what seemed like uh, many um, hours, but after minutes, was able to get access to an interpreter. And on the prior slide, I'll show you, um, we should go back to the prior slide, that uh, when we finally got uh, access to uh, interpreters to, to speak with her, um, she admitted that she was afraid. And she asked a couple of questions, um, and most specifically, what we would do uh, to address her suffering. On the next slide, um, uh, and if we can uh, get that one pulled up. There were two really important questions that we asked. And one was, why did this happen to her? And what should we do? And I think it's important, the stories that we tell about why uh, this pandemic has happened and why it has affected us the way that we are really important to framing the way that we move forward. And so I'm going to ask this question uh, throughout the talk, and I'm going to uh, recommend that we all do the same. But let's take a, a, a look at this global pandemic on the next slide. What we see um, is that the, uh, the global burden uh, on the next slide, let's advance it. Um, perfect. Yeah, the global burden of, uh, of the geography of uh, COVID-19 is really um, centered on the Americas now. So we see this 15 million cases uh, in the Americas. We see uh, a four and a half million cases in Brazil. Uh, and 750 in Peru, which also have really high uh, death rates per, portion, uh, per million. But we see that the epidemiology in the United States in particular is about 6.6 .6 million of, of those cases. And uh, as of today, uh, or as of this week, 200,000 200, deaths. Um, as we look at um, each of these countries and each of these stories, each geography has its own history and its own story. I'd like to talk a little bit about what this looks like in the United States. Let's advance the slide. On the next slide, I wanted to show you the geography of COVID-19 mortality. As we look at it early in March 2020, up at the top left, you see that primarily it looked as if um, there were several super spreader events in the Northwest. Uh, you see some of the super spreader events in the Northeast and the incidents look very much like this in terms of geography. But as the uh, pandemic has progressed, you see um, what the geography looks like in May. And I wanted to call your attention in particular to uh, the geography in September uh, 2020. And I also mentioned that I am a social epidemiologist. And when you see this pattern, uh, so we see the mortality that's sort of centered in the Southwest, um, in the South, Southern states that really spares the Northeast, this sort of patterning uh, of uh, disease uh, mortality also brings to mind uh, other patterns. 
And I'd like to call your attention to the bottom slides, the uh, bottom three, uh, the social patterning of, uh, of inequality in the United States can be measured in several ways. Uh, I show you on the bottom left, uh, the, social, uh, the social vulnerability index uh, measured by the Centers for Disease Control that gives us a sense of uh, home, um, the extent to which people are homeless, um, po other measures of poverty and inequality. Uh, in the center uh, bottom graph, we look at the uh, county level data on food insecurity at, in the United States, and you see what that patterning has looked like uh, for a long time. Uh, the, there are data from uh, out of University of Chicago, NORC, uh, that also show um, the increase in the, uh, the inability to get food during the pandemic, as high as 34% um, nationally uh, in groups who, uh, in uh, families with children. And also some work that we have done uh, looking at the way that we have made choices around access to care and those who delay care uh, because they can't afford care also has this social patterning. And so as we think about why, why is this happening and what does this uh, burden look like, um, it's important to uh, keep this framework in mind. And on the next slide, we'll see that um, there's a geographic story, but there's also a story about racial and ethnic burden. And we look at the disproportionate uh, racial and ethnic burden of COVID-19 on this slide in national data. And what you can see is that in particular in groups that are African-American and um, in groups that identify as being uh, Latina, Latino or Hispanic, that um, though African-Americans and Hispanic groups make up about 13 to 14% of the population, uh, they make up more than 20% uh, of the, the deaths. And you also see this in uh, data around uh, American Indian and Alaska Native populations, uh, a little bit harder uh, to get those data. And even at the time of this survey, only about 22 to 23 states, I think, were able to report these data. But the disproportionate burden of both uh, the cases as well as mortality and, and disease are seen here. But why would that be so? Let's look at the next slide. We often think of this as a clinical story, that there are clinical risk factors for COVID-19. And I'm presenting uh, data here that um, are summarized in a, a JAMA publication recently that um, took advantage of the Centers for Disease Control uh, hospital surveillance system, as well as looking at data out of Italy and out of uh, New York, the United States. And uh, we see that the diseases that are associated with hospitalization uh, for COVID uh, really were the diseases associated with stress, inflammation, sort of multiformidity, and also diseases of abnormal aging. Uh, and as we think about what those diseases look like, the thing I want uh, you to take away uh, more than any other point is that only about 25% of patients who were hospitalized for COVID-19 had a chronic comorbidity. Those who did have those comorbidities, um, you can see in the slide here about uh, 48 to 57% had hypertension, cardiovascular diseases made up 21 to 28% of those cases, diabetes uh, was present in about 17 to 34% of cases, and then additionally chronic kidney disease, cancer, or chronic liver disease were also present, but only about 4 to 10% had, had lung diseases, so chronic pulmonary diseases and other uh, related conditions. So if only 25% of people who were hospitalized for COVID-19 had these sort of diseases, and if the diseases that, uh, that people did present with were these sort of stress and inflammation uh, related diseases, what, what is happening and what is going on? And so let's advance the slide. We have to start asking ourselves questions about other kinds of frameworks and other kinds of explanations and think about the social risk factors for COVID-19. And I'd like us to take a step back and uh, understand what are called social determinants of health. And the World Health Organization defines it in the following way. The social determinants are the circumstances in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age the systems that we put in place to deal with illness, and that the systems and circumstances that we found, find ourselves in are all shaped by our human choices, by our economics, by our social policies, and by our politics. So these things all come into play in the way that we, um, that we think about illness, the causes of illness, and, and also that play into the solutions. On the next slide, uh, I wanted to show you the uh, WHO framework in more detail. And we see this, uh, that as we think about what are the sort of places where we want to intervene, 
we need to think about these structural determinants. Um, you've heard a lot about structural and systemic racism, and those are really embedded in the, our governance, in our economic policies, in our culture, norms and values, which then ex shape the experience of individuals and also shape the material circumstances. We talked about food insecurity. They shape the way that we interact with each other. And these things, we are socially determined, but biologically embodied so that we begin to experience inflammation and other of uh, the basic uh, biological mechanisms that contribute to our health and well-being. And that healthcare is not divorced from these broader social factors, but also shaped by them and all contribute to uh, patterns of disease that, uh, that we see um, in several disease models, including COVID-19. So on the next slide, as we start to ask this question about what the causes are and what might be influencing uh, COVID-19, uh, both uh, cases and mortality, and this disproportionate burden that we see geographically and by race ethnicity, we need to apply a framework that helps us to also consider social and structural determinants of health. And so as we start to ask this question, even for my patient, how did this happen? Uh, we need to think about the legacy of uh, inequities in the United States, including mechanisms like residential segregation, the idea that uh, occupational protections are not applied evenly, that uh, often populations are not able to take time off of work because of differences in sick pay and economic inequities that uh, put people at risk of not being able to afford the basic necessities and the ability to self-quarantine and other factors stress and violence that are also underpinnings. And there are uh, data, uh, including uh, research out of our group that have looked at associations between perceived violence and biological responses, including inflammation, as well as the way that we organize healthcare uh, and access to testing. So the systemic and structural inequities are uh, also um, connected to our health systems and become uh, both socially, behaviorally, and biologically embedded. And we need to think about all of these frameworks as we uh, formulate our response. On the next slide. So what does that mean for us? What should we do? And I wanted to give you an example of the way that we thought about this in terms of basic principles uh, related to our COVID-19 response policy, community health, employee equity, and patient care equity were factors that we realized that we needed to embody in our response. We can't ask um, our, our patients uh, to uh, take this burden on. We have to care for each other and we also have to uh, uh, address context if we hope to have an equitable response. And I'll show you a couple of things on the next slide. Uh, in terms of uh, thinking about this, we realized that we needed to have a systemic response and we embedded several work streams to address employee equity, community health, access to care uh, within our work streams at, um, at Brigham in my hospital. And we also uh, made sure we took attention to uh, communicating across the digital divide and policy. On the next slide, I'll show you a little bit about our data and monitoring stream. Uh, this um, is, uh, photo may be very familiar to many of you. It was a humbling moment uh, when we put together our response to realize that we didn't actually have data on our own patient populations to understand the uh, impact of uh, COVID-19 even on our own populations. So one of our first uh, um, steps was to collect that data and we'll see on the next slide. Uh, that we were able to stand up pretty quickly uh, dashboards to help us to think about uh, what this looked like in our own uh, inpatient populations. And what we saw is that both race, ethnicity, language, and geography of our patients looked very different uh, than the populations we had taken care of previously. Um, specifically, we had 30% uh, absolute increases in the proportion of patients who did not speak English in our population. So we realized that we needed very quickly to put uh, strategies and structures in place to manage this diverse population. And there were still data gaps. Uh, we did not have and do not have good data on pa patients with uh, disabilities, as well as good data on sexual orientation and gender identity. On the next slide. Uh, some of the solutions that we put in place uh, were to optimize our workflows and to uh, make sure that we had additional equipment to care for patients uh, across language divides. On the next slide, 
we also needed to make sure that we provided basic access to inpatient care across race, ethnicity, and language divide. And this is a, a photograph of Francisco Marty. At the Brigham, we did have access to Desivir, and uh, Dr. Marty was um, instrumental in monitoring and making sure that patients uh, received access to clinical trial drugs equitably. On the next slide, an important part of our outreach was also community health. And you'll see here that we were able to stand up several testing sites to provide both um, clinical care, so SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus testing, as well as social care, screening patients for their social needs and providing for uh, food insecurity. On the next slide, I wanted to bring all this together and to sort of mention that uh, if there was any lesson that I learned through this uh, pandemic, it's just that we have to think really specifically about the questions that we ask. It was a humbling moment to realize that it was really journalism in some ways that helped us to ask these questions around the demographics and our patients. And so continue to ask why is this happening and to deepen the kinds of stories that we tell about it that we have to care in ways that often cross our professional boundaries. And it's um, a pleasure to be on the panel uh, with uh, so many physicians who will uh, show us, including uh, Jim O'Connell, who will speak in a moment and talk to us about what that looks like in uh, patients who are homeless, and that none of this can be done alone. So as we think about bridging the clinical, the social, the structural, we have to do that in community. And so I appreciate you, uh, uh, this, this conversation and look forward to uh, your questions as I hand it over to Jim uh, for his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, <clears throat> and um, thanks to everyone for uh, allowing me these few moments to talk about um, our little, the lens through which we see the world. And that's from the world of uh, healthcare for the homeless program in Boston. But, um, the first slide, if I could show you, is um, the oldest, I think one of the oldest slides I use. And um, it's a picture that was taken by a woman who lived for years under the Longfellow Bridge, which crosses the Charles River right near Mass General. Um, she's quite a character, but she took this picture with a throwaway camera back in the end of 1999, uh, just before Y2K. Uh, I didn't see the picture until she was going in for surgery about five years later, and she asked me to hold on to her stuff. Um, and she showed me the picture and I was kind of stunned because I knew all of the people in that picture from our street uh, work. Um, and they were all pretty interesting characters, but the picture really hit me for several reasons. One is um, this was taken in 1999 when all of these street, these are rough sleepers, real hardcore rough sleepers in Boston, but they all had Medicaid because we had expanded Medicaid by that time. So they all had insurance. Um, and then the second thing is um, that they're sitting in a little park, which is called Mousy Park, after a homeless man who died there in 1985, which is literally on the grounds of Mass General Hospital, about 100 yards from the emergency room. Um, and when I looked at that picture five years after it was taken, and the average age of, there's 10 men there, by the way, there's one woman who's hiding, she didn't want to be the only woman in the picture, but the average age they, of those men was about 37, 38, <clears throat> and when I looked at the picture five years later, there was only one of them still alive. And so the inequities in the healthcare system um, that have been magnified by COVID-19 have been pretty evident to us since 1985 when we first started doing this. The people living on the streets of Boston, just to give you an example, um, one of our physician assistants published a paper in JAMA Internal Medicine last year with Travis Baggett, one of our other researchers, and showed that people on the streets of Boston die at three times the rate of people in the shelters. People living in the shelters of Boston um, die at four times the rate of somebody the same age in the city of Boston. So that means these folks living on the street have a 12-fold mortality, increased mortality risk than any of us of the same age. And that's in a setting where they're literally sitting in the shadows of my own hospital, thinking that we should probably do a better job. But anyway, our program, just to quickly show, has, um, was a, a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation program back in 1985. Our mandate, uh, told to us by the homeless people we were serving, was to do clinics in all the shelters, to go to where everybody was, maintain our clinics at Boston City, which is now Boston Medical Center and Mass General, because homeless people felt when they were sick, they were in the hospital, we need to be there. And then we were also committed to come up with a respite program. And we have about 124 beds now of respite care for people that are um, not so sick, they have to stay in the hospital, but clearly not ready to go home and don't have a home to go to where they could have pretty good care. 
Um, so what happened is when we knew that the epidemic or the pandemic was coming, um, we, we looked around and realized we had no, there was no redundancy in our services. Our clinics were pretty crazy. Our McGinnis house was really full. So we had to literally turn ourselves upside down. And our big fear was that the shelters in Boston, many of them are three to 500 people in a relatively small space. And we have long experience with, with epidemics coming through that the shelters become particularly dangerous during a time of a communicable disease. So in the next slide, you can see the first thing we started to do was to make sure we tested everybody going into the shelters. And we had this remarkable physician assistant in our program named Jonathan Harris, who organized our testing thing. And in the beginning, as you would all remember, we were, we were screening people um, in order to, and the only ones who could get a test were those who passed the screen. So we screened everybody coming into the shelters and found virtually no one um, who had really significant symptoms. The one we did send um, mostly came back negative. But we realized when people were waiting for their test results, we needed to get them somewhere. So on the next slide, um, uh, Jesse Gator, who's our chief medical officer, and Barry Bach, who's our CEO, came up with this kind of interesting idea of setting up some tents since the shelters had no room for people. If you passed a screen and needed, needed testing and we waited the two days for the test results, we would quarantine you in these tents. Um, and the tents are really pretty sophisticated. I won't dwell on them, but they have negative pressure. Um, they were designed by mass, by mass design and put up by Suffolk Construction. And from the moment we thought about it till the time they were up was about five days. It was quite an experience for us as a collaborative effort around town. The second thing we did on the next page was convert our, um, the next slide, excuse me, convert our McGinnis House. This is our main building at 780 Albany Street, right in the corner of Mass Ave. Used to be, for those of you who are historical, it was, a, the, um, it was the Mallory Institute of Pathology before we moved in there in 2008. And we have 104 beds of respite care on the top three floors. And we converted one of those floors into a complete COVID unit. So when homeless people were diagnosed with COVID but didn't need an ICU or hospital, we could uh, decant the hospitals and let them stay there. And so what happened to be very quickly is we saw through March, we saw almost no homeless people uh, test positive um, until right at the very end of March, we had a small cluster of people and the common denominator was Pine Street Inn, one of the shelters where we have a clinic every day of the week, 14 hours a day. So um, with that small um, cluster, the Department of Public Health to their credit, allowed us to do for the first time universal testing of everybody going into the shelter. And the next slide will show you um, sort of a headline here. So we actually did Pine Street in and found out lots of things that I'm gonna share with you, but I wanna be sure I tribute Travis and Harrison who were really key in doing this. But um, in the next slide, uh, you can see the pattern of testing that we did. So if you look at that very first day, Pine Street in over two nights in early April, we found that 147 of the 416 people going into the shelter uh, tested positive. The thing I would highlight of this though, is only one of those people had a fever and less than 10% had any symptoms at all. So this is early April. We're realizing that we went from thinking no one was ill in the shelter or just a very few to finding out that many, many people were spreading the virus. Um, and we had to I'll go back to that in a second, but this is a progression of what the state let us allowed us to do although it was a huge amount of work as you can imagine was was test all of the main shelters in boston and after that we tested everybody every two weeks because of this asymptomatic spread and you can see that essentially in all of the shelters in boston a third to 40 percent of everybody was turning positive and the vast majority over 90 percent had no symptoms whatsoever at the time we did the testing um, as you can see now it's gone the numbers have gone down and now just to let you know we're now down to less than one percent uh, positive positivity rate in the shelters and now we're doing surveillance testing but in the next uh, picture i want to show you what our dilemma was as i try to finish up here quickly but we had to figure out where 147 people in pine street one night were positive we had to put them somewhere and in our system there's nowhere to go so we filled up our McGinnis house, which is the 52 beds, and then working with the city, the state, the hospitals, with Mass General and the Brigham, um, and really quite an extraordinary governor, mayor, Department of Public Health of the city and state effort, um, Boston Hope was opened. And um, it was really quite staggering. This is the uh, Boston Convention Center. 
and there were 500 beds of a step-up hospital or a, a pop-up hospital that MGH Brigham ran. And adjacent to that, we had 500 beds for homeless and other poor people who had COVID but no safe place to stay. And that's, I think in the next slide, you can see a picture of that. And it was, it was extraordinary. It took a lot of effort on a lot of people's thing, but it was, um, as I step back and think on my career, this was one of the more extraordinary citywide uh, academic or town gown efforts, and it was quite extraordinary. So next slide, just a couple things to share with you as I end here. Uh, the um, Sabeti Lab at, at MIT in the Broad, um, led by um, Jay Clemieux and uh, Bronwyn uh, McGinnis, actually looked at the genomics of the, of the uh, virus in the early days of the epidemic. And just as an interesting thing, all of the stuff we were seeing in the shelter, all of those viruses came directly from the Biogen conference. Really interesting thing. The second thing we learned, um, and the next slide, and this is my last slide, um, in addition to so much asymptomatic spread, we also found that this was not a particularly virulent virus for us. We had models that had been published by the University of Pennsylvania predicting that when the virus hit the homeless population, we would have high hospitalization rates and very high mortality rates. But in the 900 people that we had that were positive, we had a total of, of 12 deaths. And all of those were in elderly people who were very, very debilitated. But almost no one else was hospitalized or ended up in a ventilator. We do not know, by the way, why that is. Um, we're looking forward to learning more as we go along. And we're continuing to test regularly because we're pretty sure there's going to be a second wave come and the, and the homeless shelters are so vulnerable to that. Uh, an interesting last thing I'd share that as those people that I showed you that lived outside, there's about two or 300 people that are hardcore live outside in Boston. And as far as we know, there's only one of them that has tested positive during this time. So it, the, another paradox of all this was it's probably safer to be outside than to be in a shelter. Not that I recommend to anyone stay outside. Anyway, let me leave it at there. There's a ton of interesting things, but people who are forced to live in shelters or on the streets are so vulnerable, not only to COVID, but so many other things. But thank you. I'm so honored to um, be here. And I get to pass this on to Elise Wurcell now, who will tell you about another fascinating group of people that live not in shelters, but in prisons. Hi, um, I'm thrilled to be part of this group, this stellar cast of people. Um, and I'm gonna talk about COVID-19 in the jails. Um, next slide, please. So I, I, I want you to know about me. So I'm an ex-waiver, that means I can provide buprenorphine. I'm an ID physician, um, and I'm actually an NIH-funded health disparities researcher. Um, and prior to COVID, I provided infectious diseases care in six of the county jails in Eastern Massachusetts. Um, and then early in March, um, the Massachusetts Sheriff's Association, led by uh, Sheriff Peter Katusian of Middlesex County, um, reached out and asked me to be provide consultations for COVID-19 mitigation and preparedness for all the jails. So really since day one, I have been actively heavily involved in many of the decisions surrounding jails um, response to COVID. So next slide, please. And one thing I want to take a put across and the, consider this the clinical pearl is that jails and prisons are often used interchangeably um, in the press or in popular media, but they are very different. And so I want to just point out what the differences between jails are. So I'm going to start with prisons on the right. So prisons have longer periods of incarceration, typically greater than 2.5 years. They're run at the federal and the state level. Um, at least in Massachusetts, all of the prisons are, are um, the medical care is um, um, coordinated by WellPath. Overall, it's an older population with ha more risk factors for severe COVID-19 disease. Now, in contrast, um, the jails have shorter incarceration periods. Um, and I can say, um, looking at data from Middlesex County Jail, um, the median time of incarceration is about 40 days. And actually, most people um, are incarcerated less than 40 days. Um, it's run at the county level. Um, so in each of the counties, the sheriffs make decisions about policies for the jail. There are different healthcare companies, at least four different ones, um, 
and and some uh, some jails actually operate with the state uh, managing or the county managing the healthcare. It's overall a younger population, and we know for for whatever reason that uh, younger people are at less risk for severe COVID nineteen disease. Now that's not to say that people from jails don't go to prisons, and people who could go to prisons don't go to jails, and people can have um, go from one jail to the next jail depending on um, where they have to do time based on their sentence. So this, disti this distinguishing factor, I hope, can go into everyone's brain and really whenever you read or learn about jails and prisons and COVIDs, you think about are they talking about a prison or are they talking about a jail? Next slide, please. So why worry about the impact of COVID-19 in jails and prisons? So we know that there is a synergistic impact of incarceration in infectious diseases. We know that from tuberculosis, from HIV, we've had outbreaks in the Commonwealth for hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hep C for sure. These are places in which there's a high concentration of people um, who are at risk for infectious diseases. Um, so black and brown communities are incarcerated at disproportionate rates, and that's relevant in the context of this conversation, in that we know Black and Brown communities are dying at disproportionate rates. Embedded in the whole existed of the hierarchy of the jails, no matter how much I try to gain trust or you set up a clinician who wants to treat the person who's incarcerated with the most um, quality care possible, there is hundreds of years of mistrust and distrust deeply embedded into the health care that we're providing in the jails, and we have to work against that. Um, and then lastly, there's this thing called the churn um, in which people are going in and out of jails, mostly jails, not prisons. And that's why it's important to think about incarcerated in jails in that the health of the people in the jails is directly related to the health of people who are in the community living outside of the jails. Um, next slide, please. So I just want to walk you through the experience of COVID in the jails. Um, so the first case of COVID in the US was in January 20th. Um, the first case of COVID-19 in the Massachusetts prisons um, was in March 21st. And, and soon after, clusters of infections started emerging in the jails. There were two times um, that the CDC came out with the um, guidelines. That's at the bottom, March 23rd and then July 22nd. There were interspersed along there. There were sort of additions, but those were the two times that they came out for guidance. So prior to that, we were really um, coming up with plans um, with the best of our abilities, to the best of our knowledge, trying to do the best that we could. Um, I wrote one of the first uh, pieces trying to discuss COVID-19 mitigation policies in the jails, which was published online on March 28th. Um, and after publishing that, every week I met with leaders across the country to see what people were doing in their jails, how they were handling the epidemics around them, and trying to learn best practices so we can benchmark and bring them into our jails. Um, and when the clusters of COVID started to emerge, um, we started putting in place um, ways to contain them, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then on June 2nd, Dr. Scott Allen um, out in California testified and said it um, about um, how, what needs to be done in jails and how we can improve everything. So now, and I'm one of the founders of this thing called COVID Prison Project. Um, you can go to it, covidprisonproject.com, and see it has really detailed information about prison cases. So you can see the current, I pulled the report from the United States about how many cases there are. And I, I say this is from prisons, not jails. But in Massachusetts jails, as of this week, there have been 284 positive cases in all the jails. There have been two deaths. And as of today, to my knowledge, there are zero active cases of COVID in the jails. Now, as far as corrections officers, which has been a lot of focus because they're coming from the community into the jail, they are essential workers. They were working throughout the pandemic. There have been 155 positive, zero deaths, and there are five active cases. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the challenges that we faced. Um, so first of all, we had a really hard time getting personal protective equipment, whereas everyone was scrambling to get it. Each of the jails was scrambling as well. Next slide. Then the COVID-19 testing supplies. So that means the actual flock swabs. We had a hard time in the jails acquiring them even early on when we wanted to test a lot of people. Um, so next slide. 
is COVID testing laboratory. So each of the tests, each of the jails needed a laboratory to send the tests to. Um, and so most of the jails rely on LabCorp or other places, uh, Quest. Those were backlogged. So we were having a hard time getting rapid turnaround. Then as for the next things, we had to shut down visitation, we, which is the next slide. We had to limit transportation in that the courts were all shut down. So um, we couldn't transport people back and forth toward the courts. Non-acute medical care, which is the next slide, um, was something that we really had to determine if it was truly acute or non-acute. So things had to be delayed the same way it was in the community. Um, as far as release and reentry coordination went and other programming, um, we had to make decisions. Uh, people were decarcerated quite rapidly. We had to work to get their um, health insurance reactivated, link them to buprenorphine or other care. And oftentimes we had to find a way, place for them to go if they were homeless. And that was something that came up quite a bit. So next slide. Great. So these are the ways we solved the problems, and I only have a limited amount of time, but early on, MEMA helped and started to distribute the personal protective equipment into the jails, and we were able to ask that each of the corrections officers and the people incarcerated were to wear um, masks. Um, the DPH in the state provided supplies early on, and then I was able to link um, jails with most with academic centers. B.I. Deaconess was the first to step up, and they were linked with two of the jails, Essex and Middlesex County, and then Tufts, and then the Brigham MGH group also stepped up, and slowly we were able to link most of the jails with an academic center. Um, we suspended visitation during the peak, but we've opened since then in July. All visitations are being done through plexiglass, so there is no um, visitation, with the exception of sometimes we've been allowing in certain places outside visitation. Um, telehealth was used for, for non-acute medical care and visits were postponed. And I think just like in the community, we're going to see things that we wish we could have done, um, but we couldn't because everything was shut down. Uh, in release and reentry coordination, Mass Health made modifications early on, um, which helped. Um, and then we increased our testing. Sometimes places in the community needed to have a test in order for people to go to them. And so we were able to do that. And we postponed a lot of the program during the peak, during the peak but it's slowly reopening now. And it was only through really intense communication and lots of meetings about how can we do the best care for people in jail and keep them safe that these were able to, be ha to happen. Next slide. So as of now, we have zero people who are incarcerated and diagnosed with active COVID. Like I said, there are five corrections with active COVID. People who are newly incarcerated undergo a 14-day quarantine period before they're allowed into general population. COVID-19 testing is available at all jails. And asymptomatic testing can be done on based on specific scenarios. Definitely, um, if there is someone that is identified as having COVID, and they um, we can we have in the past tested the entire um, area, um, the entire uh, community in which they've been living in. Um, and continued collaboration between the Mass Sheriff's Association, the DPH, and myself. Every step of the way has been guided by the DPH with meetings with the DPH set up. Each of the jails, after they've had cases, have been assigned a DPH um, liaison, and we've made decisions together. So none of these decisions, are, none of the decisions are being made in a vacuum. It's being made as a partnership. Next. And so this is my second to last slide. Flu preparedness is key. I've been on several conference calls this past week with all the sheriffs and with the DPH trying to figure out how we're going to push out flu vaccine. And I actually did a video which is gonna be circulated at each of the jails and has been translated into Spanish, trying to dispel some of the common myths about flu vaccine. We hope that we can continue efforts to keep the incarceration popul population low. That was a key portion of our success and not losing more people to COVID-19 um, death, um, and that we had really decreased the amount of populations in the jail. And I really hope to continue partnership with industry, academic centers, and the DPH to try to get state-of-the-art reliable testing, rapid testing into the jails. Next slide. I thank you so much for your time. Here are some resources. And I just want to, this, this talk is in memory of two great, two great female in, uh, physicians that we lost in April and May. Um, Dr. Knox is a GI doctor. She was a Harvard medical student. Um, and she has, she as well as Dr. Bika, who's an infectious diseases doctor and one of the 
uh, early leaders in research and care for people who are incarcerated. They have inspired me to be who I am. I miss them greatly. And um, if I can inspire anyone else to go into working in jails and taking care of people who experience incarceration, um, I know they would be proud. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, hi there, my name is Wes Boyd. I'm a psychiatrist um, who's been working with immigrants uh, for many years and asylum seekers for about the last 15 years. I helped start a clinic uh, at Cambridge Health Alliance in 2010 and more recently uh, helped start a clinic for asylum seekers at Harvard Medical School. Next slide, please. Although you might not be aware, um, seeking asylum is actually fully legal, both according to US law and to international law. Um, immigration, the ability to immigrate and seek asylum has also been enshrined as a human right in one of the foundational documents of the UN, namely the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Um, I should also say that if individuals are arrested for immigration crimes, say arrested at the border, uh, if they're undocumented and have crossed uh, without authority, those, crime, those are not criminal matters, they are civil matters. So if you're arrested uh, for immigration crimes, it's a civil offense. And this is going to be important given what is happening to um, immigrants during uh, COVID times. Next slide, please. Also, um, next slide when you're ready. Um, also, uh, by way of context to know what's happening, to understand the, the risks that individuals face during times of COVID, I just want to say that overwhelmingly, in my experience, when individuals are seeking asylum, they overwhelmingly face death if they remain in their home countries. If you are gay and, or lesbian in many countries around the world, that is tantamount to a death sentence. If you're living in Central America um, and you consistently say no to gangs, if you're a young boy and they're asking you to run drugs for the gang and you say no, you're going to be killed. If you're a, a young woman and you're asked to be a girlfriend of someone in the gang, which is uh, you know, essentially being asked to be a sex slave, and you say no and you say no consistently, you're going to be killed. I say this because I want people to, in the audience to understand the very real fear and risk of death that people face if they're forced to return home. Um, also, if individuals have come through, the, uh, through Mexico en route to the southern border uh, from Central America, um, they're facing overwhelming hardships even on the, the, the trip here. Um, kidnapping is quite common. Sexual assaults on women are, are dramatically common. The figure I saw actually was about 80%. And in my personal experience with the hundreds of people I've seen over the years, that figure sounds about right, unfortunately. Um, next slide, please. And so not only are individuals uh, facing death uh, or assault if they stay at home or en route to the United States, but once they get to the southern border, they're actually uh, still subject to any number of horrors. Um, the migrant protection protocol was in place before COVID, um, and that's also called the Remain in Mexico policy. Uh, what that does is force immigrants to remain in Mexico while their uh, number is being considered, and it's sort of a lottery system historically. Um, but while people are remaining in Mexico, they face extortion, kidnapping, and death. And now, of course, uh, since COVID has come around, um, the rates of infection in these border camps are dramatically high. Uh, since COVID has happened, the United States has actually changed policy yet again and said, now we're not going to allow anyone to come into the United States. And so if someone does come into the United States, they are forced to return, uh, forcibly return either to Mexico, if that's where they came from, or to their home country. And that's irrespective of the seriousness of their asylum claim. And in fact, at present, their asylum claim is not even being heard. And that obviously is in, in um, conflict with both international law and uh, fundamental uh, foundational documents in human rights. Um, next slide, please. Uh, 
for those who actually have made it into the United States, uh, the dangers of COVID um, are quite high. Right before COVID hit, children were being put into larger and larger groupings of people. So and obviously large groups are uh, conducive to spreading COVID. In immigration detention, um, there's very little opportunity for social distancing, very little screening, uh, poor sanitation, and this is uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID, uh, across the board, um, and very little access quite frequently to healthcare when people need it. Additionally, uh, a, co uh, a co-author of mine and a federal whistleblower uh, shed light on the fact that solitary confinement is being used to contain individuals either who have COVID, are suspected of having COVID, or even to, in some cases to keep people away from others with COVID. And solitary confinement is tantamount to torture according to every international standard uh, of which I'm aware. Um, and I emphasized what I did about immigration not being a criminal offense because you're putting non-criminals into solitary confinement, which is abhorrent. And also, unlike individuals who are charged with crimes here in the United States who are guaranteed access to legal services, uh, those arrested for immigration violations are not. And so the opportunity to get legal representation is spotty, often based on uh, humanitarian outreach and some other um, options as well. Next slide, please. So what are some of the solutions? Uh, as Elise said before, I think providing flu shots for ICE detainees is absolutely essential. Uh, last year, flu shots were not given, intentionally not given to people in immigration detention. And uh, given the concerns about double infection and risk this year, obviously with COVID, the stakes are even higher than they are in usual years. Another thing we ought to do is allow those in border camps in Mexico to actually come into the United States and stay with relatives here. Data show that 92% of them actually do have relatives here in the United States. Uh, they could come in, they could easily quarantine for 14 days and it could be done safely and it would be much, much, much safe. It would be safe for people in the United States in terms of infection, but also much safer for them not to be forced to remain in border camps. Um, also, um, people in detention have not committed crimes. They ought to be released. Some individuals have been released due to COVID, but it's a real tiny minority. One thing that is keeping them in prison is the fact that so many people in immigration detention are being held in for-profit prisons, uh, which obviously have motivation not to release individuals. Last figure I saw was over 70% of immigration, those in immigration detention were being held in for-profit prisons. And my final point is that we ought to be promoting, and I say this, I've said this pre-COVID, it still applies, we ought to be promoting legal immigration given the data and statistics that overwhelmingly show the benefits of having immigrants come into the United States. Thank you so much for having me on this panel. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Barbara. Thank you so much. And it's again, my pleasure uh, to be part of this wonderful panel with my panelists and to be part of this uh, discussion. So I'm going to turn back a little bit to talk about clinical research and clinical research leading to better care. Could I have the next slide? I wanna make sure that uh, you know that these opinions are mine or the groups and not uh, the, the position of Brigham Health or Harvard University. We are supported by voluntary contributions, but we're, we're committed to autonomy in our research and transparency. Could I have the next slide? So the Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Center is a research and policy center that is um, dedicated to improving the integrity, safety, and rigor of international clinical trials. We do that by engaging diverse stakeholders, uh, industry, uh, patient, patient advocates, academics, uh, and many others to uh, define emerging issues in global clinical trials and to create and implement ethical, actionable, and practical solutions. Uh, could I have the next slide? So, you know, we start from the background that clinical trials are needed to develop new treatments and new vaccines. That's true in COVID-19 as it is in all other diseases. And that the participants in the trial, 
should reflect the part population affected by the disease or those intended to utilize or use the intervention. In other words, our participants in clinical trials should be representative of those affected by the disease or in the population. And all individuals should not be anticipated to respond similarly to those interventions. Underrepresented in clinical trials of Black, Latinx, Asian, Native Americans, and other underserved populations, as well as in certain places, women and individuals at either end of the age spectrum, is not new. It persists in both industry and academic trials and across therapeutic areas. As Dean Daly and Dr. Clark said, and mentioned the race and ethnicity are not biological determinants, but we know that social determinants of health have real biology and have a real impact on biology. So, di but diverse representation in trials is not simply a matter of biology. It's a matter of health equity, fairness, and public trust. Could I have the next slide? We know that uh, health disparities by race and ethnicity in the COVID-19 pandemic, as we've reviewed today, is disproportionately felt by black and brown uh, communities. The incidence of, uh, of uh, disease per 10,000 people of black and brown communities exceeds three to four times that of white population. And that is also true uh, if you look at uh, um, uh, age adjusted, and if you look at um, death as well. So this is disproportionate uh, to their representation in, um, in society. Could I have the next slide? And yet, if you look at the representation of black and brown communities in COVID-19 clinical trials, there is racial disproportionality. Now we heard about Dr. Marty's experience at the Brigham being able to represent uh, uh, diverse communities in the trial, but that's really the exception. And this has come into focus over the last uh, number of months. Um, I think that there is a general national effort to start to recruit and to focus on recruiting appropriate individuals to those trials. Could I have the next slide? But I want to emphasize that this is not new. As early as five years ago, and even before that, data was collected by the FDA that showed the participation of Black or African American individuals in oncology and cardiology, cardiovascular diseases, was less than 3%, uh, despite the fact that those individuals um, have an incidence and a severity of disease that exceeds that of the white population. And indeed, those are, for the trials, the registration trials of the drugs that are reviewed in that year. So of course, there's some variability uh, depending on what drugs get approved in that year. Um, but the, the, there is some experience that shows that you can do a better job in psychiatric disease. Fully 24% of the individuals in trials uh, of psychiatric illness um, were African American or Black. So we know it can be done, it's just not being done routinely. Could I have the next slide? So, we need to focus on both biological variability and in health equity. It doesn't mean one needs representation in every trial, but over the course of drug development and drug analysis uh, after approval, including real world data, we need to be able to say how this, these uh, interventions and vaccines um, impact uh, individuals across the uh, race, ethnicity, and other dimensions of diversity. In the end, however, an individual is being treated, and that individual must trust the system, and the healthcare provider must be able to trust the data in order to be able to prescribe uh, for the patient in front of them. Could I have the next slide? So this starts uh, with evidence, it starts with information, it starts with trust. 
It starts with public and community engagement, and we take the position that clinical trials should address questions of importance to the community, be designed with study outcomes that people care about, people affected by the disease or condition, use language and words that people understand, and be conducted in ways that decrease the burden for those participants, and then communicate results to the communities affected by the, by the studies. They have volunteered to be put at risk for the benefit of the clinical trial and for generalizable knowledge. We owe it to them to return the results of the trials that they participated in. And we as a community have to be able to hold each other accountable at every stage and to be accountable ourselves. Could I have the next slide? <clears throat> so we, we uh, uh, began a project about two and a half or three years ago on looking at diversity, inclusion, and equity in clinical research. It was a large group of about 50 or 60 members representing all, all stakeholders and led by academia and ourselves, by industry colleagues, and by the FDA who participated in the leadership. Each served in their individual capacity, but we recently made this data available and the findings of our work available, as you can see on the hyperlink. Could I have the next slide? We took a broad definition of diversity. Today we're talking about race and ethnicity, but as Wes mentioned, sex, gender is important. Age at either end of the spectrum is, is important. As Cheryl mentioned, social determinants of health, environmental factors, comorbidities and concurrent medications. And all of those dimensions of diversity are not independent of, what, of each other. Being a black woman is different than being a white woman or black male. And again, you can increase the diversity um, and the, the subgroup analysis with um, the more uh, elements that you consider. So one cannot power a clinical trial to identify significant, statistically significant differences between each of these groups. So we need to figure out how to do that analysis better and how to collect data collectively in a way that uh, has standards and respects um, the, the, um, the different populations that people come from in communities. Could I have the next slide? So this starts, uh, this process starts with planning it starts with an attention to diversity and inclusion, and it starts by making sure that the patient and community are engaged and supportive of diverse participation. We as a community need to form relationships with the patient and communities to be in key leadership roles as advisors and as consultants to make sure that, that we're addressing questions that are of importance and that we uh, really address the, the elements of distrust or other concerns that may, may, may uh, uh, um, be present. Training and support in order to make the patient perspective to influence research priorities and questions feel heard. And then we need to have shared goals to, to tailor the study design and conduct in order to improve access enrollment and retention from those communities. We need to make sure that we have sustained partnerships and we cannot have investigators popping into a community, taking from that community and leaving. We need to make sure that there's sustained partnerships and where and we can't do that, we should have trusted intermediaries to help that. Um, and we need to build trust, uh, and that is uh, uh, undergirding all of our efforts in clinical trials and clinical care. Could I have the next slide? So when one looks at the numbers of barriers and opportunities, one sees that every, every group has responsibility for different uh, barriers and has opportunities to collect them. Given the time, I'm not going to review these, but I'll go on to the next slide and these slides will be available. One of the things we think is critically important is to understand that clear communication is a shared responsibility. We often talk about the fact that patients or some patients have quote, poor health literacy or poor literacy. We take the position that it's not the listener who has poor, poor literacy, 
it's up to the communicator to make themselves understood and, 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 and uh, share information in a way that's understandable to the listener and that the listener should be empowered to communicate any lack of understanding. That is not just plain language, that includes numeracy, visualization, design, cultural considerations, teach back, and both in verbal and written communications. Could I have the next slide? We modeled that by developing a set of research flyers in collaboration with the Harvard Catalyst to, to really try to empower patients before they get invited to a clinical trial so that they can understand what their rights are, how they can ask questions about it, and so that they feel that they're able to make an autonomous decision. And we translated all of those into Spanish and are now translating them into additional languages. Creating communication pathways that people feel comfortable with is important and making sure that we can go. Could I have the next slide, please? So in, in thinking about the number of different interventions that we can uh, create, there are uh, early interventions with engagement, literacy, feasibility assessments, and eligibility criteria. There's study conduct, thinking about the design, informed consent simplification, logistical issues, trying to create uh, 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 care in the community rather than in the clinic, um, decentralized trials so that we um, create virtual possibilities, payment, transportation, childcare, we need to standardize data collection, um, and then have a, a return of results to the, to the community. Could I have the next slide? There are other opportunities. We've talked about uh, logistics and flexibility we need to make sure that our eligibility is as, as uh, open as possible and as closed as necessary for, or restrictive as necessary for um, the, um, for safety. Um, I do think we need to attend to uh, collecting data in a way that makes our data collected uh, interoperable and we can pull these uh, data together. Um, genetics and having diverse representation in databases and data sources, which is not now currently doable or uh, present, is uh, critically important uh, in building trust. As I mentioned, each of us are accountable. Could I have the next slide? It can be done. On Monday, Genentech reported a phase three trial of patients with COVID-19 associated pneumonia, looking at one of their products, an IL-6 inhibitor. And in addition, it, in addition to or without the standard of care, they were uh, positive results, but importantly, 85% of the 389 presence patients were from minority racial and ethnic groups, majority Hispanic, with significant representation a black and African-American and Native American populations. It can be done. Can I have the next slide and last slide? So um, I think each of us need to decide to, uh, to commit to this. We need an international, national, and local, local focus going forward. Committing to inclusion is our first step. And I think the real work of change is done year by year month by month and day by day, by all of us, by each of us. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to George for questions. Thank you very much um, <clears throat> to all the speakers. Those were very, very compelling. Um, I would like to uh, turn to the Q&A section and encourage everyone to, um, if you have a question, to please submit it through the portal uh, and we'll be addressing them to our speakers and also to additional panelists. I want to point out that Howard Heller is with us who is committing half of his time to running the Mass CPR uh, community and coordinating a lot of the activities across our institutions and Bruce Walker who is the director of the Reagan Institute professor at Harvard Medical School MIT 
who is the one of the two faculty leads of the Mass CPR together with, with Arlene Sharp. <clears throat> and um, I want to uh, direct a question uh, right away to Elise or Sel, which she answered, uh, but I'd like her to actually expand a bit um, for, the, for the more general audience. The question came forward that mental health impact of further, incar uh, further isolation of incarcerated individuals is clearly a concern and whether or not that had actually been investigated in detail. And I'd like to ask Elise to expand on her answer that was in the Q&A. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a great question. And early on in, in March and April, on each of the phone calls with the sheriffs, we weighed this and we were cognizant of it. Historically, um, isolation has been a punishment. Um, and the tools that the jails have for keeping people safe from a medical and virus point of view, um, really seems in a lot of times was the same as the punishment. So I, we worked together with a lot of the sheriffs. I know um, in Essex County, they started distributing like not iPads, but a similar type of tablet. Um, there was discussions with corrections officers about identifying um, signs, worrisome signs um, for specific people that were at increased risk of potential harm. We did cohort them, weighing the risks and balances of, of potentially cohorting people and trying to do that as safely as possible. Um, mental health services were still um, up and up there. Uh, from a research perspective, it's an opportune time to investigate. I just, in the comments, put an article that was just published this month by David Cloud um, and uh, Cyrus Hall, Dallas Augustine, David Sears, and Bree Williams, which are like a really incredibly pr great group um, about um, medical isolation and solitary confinement. So as we prepare ourselves for the next year of this, I think it's time to start thinking of innovative ways to keep people in jail safe that are separate from punitive ways. Um, that will help us, especially when people have symptoms, to self-identify. Otherwise, we're shooting ourselves in the foot by saying, please tell me when you have a symptom because I'm going to put you, you know, by yourself for 14 days. So those kinds of things, uh, conversations are occurring. Um, and I think it's a ripe area for, for research. Um, and I encourage everyone who would like to take that on. Thank you, Elise. Another interesting question, which was answered briefly, but we might have a little more discussion, uh, comes from Monty Montano, uh, asking, do we have data on baseline and COVID-related inflammation levels among the different ethnicities and genders in Boston? And I'd like to ask Cheryl Clark to address that, but also to have Howard Heller and Bruce Walker uh, perhaps expand upon this in the various assessments of uh, antibody positivity as a way of tracing the epidemiology of infection across uh, certain communities in Boston, which I think turned out to be very revealing for the, uh, the disparate impact. So start first with Cheryl. And I think I'd like to start first by saying a really important question in terms of basic physiology. What I would say is that inflammation you know, has been correlated with uh, both sort of illness and sickness and our basic um, sort of drive to fight disease, but also lots of social factors. So increased in patients who perceive that they are uh, discriminated against, for example, uh, increased in patients who are stressed uh, and perceive that they um, are in violent cir circumstances. And so I, I, I will um, lean on Howard and Bruce to, uh, to ask if they have the data in Boston, but I'd point you to a, a recent um, article that was uh, published in New England Journal. Um, um, Ebony um, Price Hayward and colleagues in Louisiana published uh, some data on hospitalized patients that showed social differences between white patients or and patients who identified as white and and black or African American and really showed differences in sort of C-reactive protein um, and fibrinogen as uh, markers of inflammation. And so you see those social differences. I think um, a lot more research needs to be done to understand the underlying drivers of those and uh, and their clinical significance. Do you want to go ahead, Howard? Um, sure. I mean, I, I think it's, I mean, it's difficult, but I think it's really important to try to sort out the socioeconomic determinants of inflammation and disease and, and response to infection um, 
especially as it regards the, the immune response, because that obviously is going to be critical when it comes to vaccine and vaccine efficacy. Um, and I'm not aware of studies that have specifically been able to draw out racial or ethnic differences sorted out from socioeconomic determinants. And when the studies that have looked at it have, have suggested that, that the differences that are seen are purely socioeconomic um, uh, and, and demographic. But I, I, Bruce, I think I'd be interested in your answer to that and immune responses to um, other vaccines and the immune response, the genetic immune response to other diseases like HIV and whether we might expect to see similar things um, with COVID. Yeah, it's a really important question. And I, I think uh, both you and Cheryl have, have given uh, good answers, which is that we don't really have enough information now to be able to, to say. We do know that the microbiome, the bacteria and viruses and things that live within our bodies, influence the immune response. We also know from studies that uh, Doug Kwan um, and others have done that the microbiome can have an impact on transmission of, of a virus, in this case, HIV and its differences in the vaginal microbiome in Africa compared to Europe and the US that actually makes uh, women more susceptible to becoming infected in Africa just because of the, the bacterial makeup is different and it's a more pro-inflammatory microbiome. So I, I think those are, are really important questions that we're, we're trying to address. In fact, um, I want to give a shout out to John Lee and Zhu Yu uh, with Howard's help in putting together a, a, um, a, a basically a, a biorepository of samples during the beginning at the worst part of the COVID epidemic. Uh, and we included in that um, not just specimens of blood and plasma from infected individuals, but also um, uh, rectal swabs to be able to try and go back and figure out those relationships. So I think, I think once again, the, the, the medical response to this pandemic has been phenomenal. And I think we're going to learn a ton. Can I just make one point? Just, I'm sorry. Can, I, I just want to say that, you know, one of the things we don't do systematically is collect um, data on social determinants of health in a standardized way so that we can use this data going back and going forward and be able to compare and contrast these different populations. I think it's one of the things that we need to develop. What are the critical pieces? We don't, you know, while, while you can, um, and people have to get comfortable with that kind of questioning and finding ways to make uh, individual participants or volunteers uh, able to answer those questions so that we can use those samples and use those biobanks appropriately. Yeah, and we tried as best we could I during know. a very difficult time to, uh, in terms of uh, being able to interface with patients during the chaos of the early epidemic, to get as much, as many of those social determinants uh, codified as we could on the patients we were enrolling. So hopefully we'll make a start, but I agree with you completely, Barbara. Yeah, and we, we, are, we are making progress with that in that there were other groups, uh, spe specifically the people doing outcomes work, that were doing really laborious chart data extractions that could not just be pulled out of the uh, electronic medical record and compiling a lot of that really important um, socioeconomic and other demographic data, which we are now hopefully going to be able to link more easily with the, with the samples that we uh, that we have in the biorepositories. Another thing that I want to uh, point out is that one of the really great things about the mass CPR is, uh, you know, John and Shu were really the leaders very, very early on, um, but also there was such a concerted effort to bring in the other institutions in Boston and in Massachusetts. One of the main reasons was specifically so that we have uh, a, a representative uh, a sample of, of, um, of all the people in all different uh, geographic and socioeconomic uh, groups within Massachusetts. Yeah, and maybe, George, do you just want to mention who the parts of the MassCPR are in case some people don't know? 
Sure. I mean, um, Bruce, feel free uh, as the faculty lead for uh, all of the intellectual force behind uh, this amazing consortium. It's been great to see your leadership um, and, and together with Arlene Sharp. So I, uh, yeah, leave it to I'll you. Just to say that it's it, it's a it's a consortium that involves UMass, BU, Tufts, MIT, and Harvard. Um, as well as the teaching hospitals, as well as the Department of Health. Um, it, it's really been extraordinary. We have about, I think we have 17 institutions or 18 institutions, as well as uh, 500 clinicians and scientists that are really interacting in a, in a way that I've never seen before. So just really been inspiring. Yeah, and you know, your conversation here with Cheryl and Howard have, uh, drawn into focus the fact that even social determinants of health translate into biological mechanisms of disease. But I'm very, very pleased that we can commit this public briefing to actually shining light on these social determinants because we have to be able to address those from perspectives that don't just involve taking a pill. We need real policy implications. We really need deep social change in order to get at the, the root causes of these disparities. Let me uh, just turn to Wes Boyd. There is a question from Sandy Recha about the regulations and standards and possibilities of contact tracing for immigrants uh, who are currently being detained. Uh, what type of care or assistance are they receiving, if any? Uh, you're on mute there, Wes. My bad, thank you. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I'm not aware of any regulations or standards uh, for administering healthcare in general to people being held in immigration detention and certainly not uh, specifically with, request to, uh, with um, respect to COVID. Uh, I would be shocked in most cases if there were any kind of contact tracing or anything like that. In terms of the kind of care that they get, I would imagine, in many of the state prisons. So uh, people held nice uh, detention sometimes are held in general prisons of the kind that Elise spoke about. Um, they have ice on their backs uh, in big stenciled letters, but other than that, they're just being held in general populations. Often the medical care in state prisons is uh, good to very good. That depends. Um, but in for-profit uh, prisons, basically every standard of care seems to be lower to much lower uh, in those instances. Obviously, you have a for-profit motive. The less care you give, the more money you get to, to keep. So um, unfortunately, it's pretty grim. Thank you, Wes. <clears throat> Uh, an interesting question from Snape Gieses in the Q&A uh, that pertains to this idea that came up um, and uh, had to do with the potential for having to ration uh, critical uh, medical interventions in settings where the, the surge of patients was so great that one might imagine overwhelming ICU capacity. Fortunately, we avoided that in Boston with great care. There was only one weekend, as I recall, where there had to be patients diverted from Boston Medical Center to other hospitals because the ICU was full. But in other parts of the world, most notably in Northern Italy, there were very grim stories of the need to triage patients and the need to ration care. Uh, in Massachusetts, there uh, has been an effort on the part of the Department of Public Health to define crisis standards of care, the kinds of principles that are put to use when in fact there is a limitation of resources. And one of the considerations has been to uh, preferentially provide the care uh, to those for whom the greatest number of life years could be sustained and maintained. But as this question points out, given that there's so many pre-triage conditioning determining patients' potential life expectancy, how can we object? How can we be objective uh, in assessing this in the context of medical triage? And I might address that 
uh, for Cheryl to comment and any of the other panelists. You're on mute too, Cheryl, sorry. <clears throat> the perpetual sort of Zoom uh, mute dilemma. Uh, so thanks for that one. But, uh, you know, no, incredibly um, important and actually um, thinking through crisis standards of care was also one of the important work streams uh, that uh, we put um, energy toward. And I want to um, really thank and, and appreciate the work of uh, Dr. Eric Ralnick at the Brigham and Emmy uh, Rosen at uh, Mass General Hospital, who uh, helped to lead a lot of this work, uh, at least from um, at my institution, from the Mass General Brigham. Uh, you know, as we sort of think about this, um, the idea of life years uh, saved was uh, a big point of contention from a couple of perspectives. Uh, one, uh, thinking about uh, patients who have, and people who have disabilities, and patients and people who have uh, decreased life expectancies because of structural factors would be uh, uh, disproportionately impacted by that. Many of us have seen uh, uh, the impactful studies that came out of uh, University of Wisconsin that have looked at life expectancy maps and even local differences like the life expectancy in Beacon Hill versus uh, Mission Hill and Roxbury are very different. And so if you bake into policy the idea that folks who are, have lower life expectancies uh, may, uh, may not uh, be eligible for the same level of care, then you really codify uh, those sorts of structural inequities. And so I'm, um, I know that the uh, state has recently opened their uh, processes and um, we'll look forward to following that. But several of those of these issues that we've talked about today uh, were addressed and uh, I look forward to seeing how the state uh, gets community engagement and, and additional uh, input into uh, furthering this conversation. Thank you, Cheryl. <clears throat> uh, another question from uh, Rachel Getz, who I, I think I'll ask Barbara to comment here, but related to clinical trial participation, how do we as clinical researchers balance the desire for a representative sample in trials with the history of abuse of vulnerable populations in clinical trials that has led to significant distrust? Um, how do you recommend and perhaps expand on some of the principles you articulated? How do you recommend rebuilding the fundamental community trust that's needed to support clinical trials? That's a great question and thank you. Um, I do <laughs> think that we came from historically uh, the sense of abuse to a uh, position in how we think about clinical trials to be a protectionist in our attitude whereby the result of that is then to have trials and data that don't represent the population and cannot speak uh, to the safety and efficacy. We need to, to embrace inclusion, and we have to do that first by uh, uh, planning all the clinical research we do to uh, address that and to keep um, a focus on patient and community engagement and start with building trusting relationships. I do think that one of the, uh, one of the um, really important part of the work that we're doing is to, is to find uh, trusted intermediaries between the clinicians and the community that have a stake in the community. So community health centers, caregivers, uh, church and faith-based uh, uh, organizations, youth centers, the people that, that understand their community far better than, than we do at the hospitals. And I think the people are really appreciating how important that is. We'll learn as we go. Let's hope we can all rebuild that trust. Barbara, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I wish we had more time. Uh, there's just a couple more questions left, but we're at the end of our, our time. And I wanna thank the presenters, Cheryl, Jim, Elise, Wes, Barbara, and also Howard and, and Bruce for participating and being able to answer these questions. I also wanna thank the Mass CPR Consortium and all of the tremendous efforts that the over 500 clinicians and scientists um, have been engaged in and to the many supporters who have provided us with the lifeblood to keep our work going. And of course, thanks to you, the audience, um, we peaked at something like 250 um, participants. Um, 
And that's wonderful. And I think whether you're a member of the public or of the news media, your constant engagement in this kind of dialogue is essential for us ultimately achieving greater equality in the distribution and delivery of healthcare. Thank you very, very much. Stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you, George.